Hi, welcome to our second video lecture on our unit on peers. And in this video lecture, we're going to look at uh, some of the different groups that uh, peers, adolescent peers forms, including cliques, crowds. We're going to talk a little bit about how sociologists and social psychologists group um, and measure uh, peer activity and peer behavior um, among adolescents. And then lastly, we're going to look a little bit at kind of dating and the function of romantic relationships. Um, so let's start with a little bit of signposting. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is what are cliques and crowds and how do they function. The second thing is what is a function, meaning what is, you know, why do people have romantic relationships? While this might seem obvious, the point is that it's more than just, let's say, uh, finding, let's say, the love of your life. There are other types of functions of this relationship that are go beyond just, let's say, the end of marriage and then long-term committed adult relationships. Um, and lastly, how does membership in peer groups affect social status? But before continuing, I just want to talk about one thing in particular. Um, I'm going to be mostly talking about kind of the terminology and categories and how these things are measured by people who are trying to study these things systematically and scientifically. Um, obviously, all of you are adolescents. Um, all of you, um, uh, you know, are involved in groups and whatever. And so if I say anything that doesn't sound right, it's probably a function that things change over time. Uh, the social dynamics of adolescents and teenagers is something that I think is remade every generation. Um, the nature of romantic relationships is something that has changed over every generation. Um, obviously, I'm more than double your age. And so the point is, is what I might be saying is more reflective of my own experience as an adolescent, but that was in the 1980s and 1990s. So with that caveat, uh, let's begin talking about some of these concepts. So the first one is just looking how uh, peers rate each other. And so what sociologists call this is sociometric status. Um, and so they ask, you know, what extent are children liked or disliked by their peer group? We saw this a little bit, um, kind of a, a use of this uh, in the last uh, video lecture where we talked about, uh, excuse me, when we talked about culture, when we talked about Roland Fryer's study about acting white and the idea that popularity went up or down depending upon one's grades and that varied among different, let's say, ethnic groups. So this might be kind of a, that was one application, this is a different application of this. But generally they um, identify five types of, you know, children. Um, and so what they do is uh, they ask two questions, like they would nom whether you nominate someone as you like them or you basically identify them as dislike them. And so you find five groups based upon that question among a larger group of adolescents. So the first one would be, you know, popular children. So these are ones that most people nominate as a good or close friend, uh, likable or desirable as a friend. And they're rarely ever by anyone disliked by anyone. So there's some people who are very, very popular, but they're also very, very unpopular because, you know, the uh, conflict between groups as well as, let's say, the, the like by the in-group. Uh, the second group is what we call average, and this is where most of us fall into, is that um, some people like us, some people dislike us. And so that the number of, let's say, nominations for being kind of friendly or likable are about the same as people who have negative nominations or dislikable or uh, not interested in being their friend. Um, there are those that are what I call neglected, which means they're not really liked a lot by anyone, but they're also not disliked a lot by anyone. And so they kind of are, you might think of wallflowers, ones that are kind of, let's say, outside the social circuit. Um, and so they're called neglected because in, in some ways you might say they don't seem to matter that much in the overall, let's say, uh, landscape of, let's say, a high school or a middle school. Um, rejected children are ones that are not um, that are not liked by a lot of people, but a lot of people dislike them. And you might see this whether if they're in a different ethnic or social group than let's say the majority, it might happen because they their interests or activities um, are different. It might be because that they have uh, hobbies or interests that really don't fit into. So if you're in a big football town and you dislike football or um, if you're kind of an artistic community and you're a jock, the point is that you don't seem to fit into your uh, social environment. Um, and lastly, you might call controversial children, which are, they're both liked and disliked. So they either, they invoke strong reactions from their peers, but they're not necessarily uh, uh, all negative or all positive interactions. So we might think of these five groups and a simple way is just asking is like, you know, yes or no, do you like child A, B, C, D? And then also a second uh, question, this is the parallel, do you dislike child A, B, or C? And they can go through like a whole school and reconstruct a social network based upon, let's say, uh, these likes and dislikes. 
So one thing that's really key here is um, emotion and social cognition. And I like the terms of this interpersonal and intrapersonal. Interpersonal is how well you understand the interaction, the dynamics between people. Interpersonal is about how you uh, understand and are able to regulate your own internal dynamics, which means your own feelings and emotions. Some people have a very good sense of who they are as a person, um, but have very a lot of difficulty interacting with friends and other people. Some people are social butterflies, but really, in a sense, don't have a well-developed, uh, mature personality. Um, and therefore, they are able to understand the dynamics, but they don't seem to have an internal anchor. So as children move into adolescence, they're going to have what more social knowledge, which means they're going to understand the social game, which means they're not going to know in a way they wouldn't know when they were younger how to gain acceptance from their peers. Um, and how does they're going to also understand how do you become part of a group? Um, so it's going to be less of a mystery. So they might understand like what music is popular and unpopular, what games are popular and unpopular, what movies are popular and unpopular, what ways to dress are popular and unpopular. Um, and it's not that they're trying, they know overall, but I um, mean, since they're like did a survey or they're a social scientist, but they might understand what are the norms and sig ways of signaling uh, membership in a different group. It might be a certain type of cosmetic, it might be a length of hair, it might be liking a certain uh, team, it might be dressing in a certain brand name clothing. Um, but the point is they know what the code is. And the point is this is interpersonal, that you might not accept this code, you might not like this code, but at least you are on just, you kind of speak the language. Um, so think of people who always seem to know what are the right things to say, the right clothes to wear, the right thing to do to gain acceptance. Um, we all know people that seem that it seems relatively easy for. Uh, most of us struggle with it in one way or another, uh, but some people just seem to have a sense of it. And also you might say they have a lot of co um, confidence in themselves about what, what things to do. And this might become that they have an older sibling um, an older brother, an older peer that kind of mentors them or at least kind of guides them and says, well, these are the rules uh, for understanding the landscape. Um, as for myself, I can very remember that uh, when, I, when I started my freshman year in high school, my older brother told me to act dumb because no one likes smart people. Um, and that might be kind of an idea that's saying like, you know, don't emphasize certain things about your personality if you want to be liked. Um, I'm not saying that this is the way you should do things, but the point is, is that whether you are aware of these things, some people you might say are social morons, I would include myself in this, that they don't seem to be aware of the clues and you know, uh, nonverbal communication that there's coming from their peers. The second aspect um, is interpersonal emotion, which is that uh, younger adolescents tend to have lots of emotions and don't seem to understand them. Their emotions are going all they're happy, then sad, they're angry, then, and then joyous, um, literally uh, swinging like a yo-yo. Um, as you become older, you will be, understand why you understand why you have certain feelings, why you have certain emotions, and you understand that regulating your emotions um, can be linked to uh, other people liking you. Like if you are kind of always depressed or if you're always moody or if you're always emotional, um, it's hard for other people to understand where you're coming from um, and they don't know what to make out of it. And people then experience the lack of success in their peer relationships and therefore they realize that maybe their emotions are getting in the way um, and people get better about controlling those emotions, which means what you express to, to the public is not exactly always what you're feeling. So that you're, you basically are able to delink uh, your behavior from your feelings. Um, this, uh, just speaking in broad brush strokes, emotionally negative people experience a lot more rejection. Uh, just most of people don't like people who are always talking about their problems as realistic and as true their, as their problems are. Um, emotionally positive people tend to be more popular because all things equal, you rather would be people who are upbeat than people who are downbeat. So the better you're able to control those emotions in terms of like how you interact with others um, can lead to more success with their peers. And social cognition is this ability to understand and then your ability to execute on this understanding about how to navigate the, the social uh, landscape. So we talked about this a little bit before, but um, one key thing in the first group of friends, you know, our first group of peers are friends. And friends are not the majority. They're usually sometimes, a re some people will have a very limited group of friends. They might only have one or two uh, close friends. They might have a relatively limited group of people they call their friends. 
Uh, this is not the same as their click. It's not the same as, let's say, what group they uh, other people perceive them into, but people that you are having an ongoing relationship that you interact with each other as individuals as opposed to members of a larger group. So they're friends, you could say that they talk to you as your first name, not as uh, cheerleader number three or nerd number four or, uh, you know, things like that. So there's a companionship, there's support, there's intimacy, which means generally you're going to talk to your friend about other things. And I think, and someone said this before in our class discussion, is that you know who your friend is because they've seen the worst of you and they still like you and have not rejected you. Um, and as a result, you can be honest with them in a way you're not honest with other people, um, even other people that you like. So I'm just going to read a quotation, um, just kind of someone describing what uh, friendship, um, obviously, I don't think I need to define this for anyone, but just for the purposes of emphasizing certain points, uh, you know, my best friend is nice, she's honest, and I can trust her. I can tell her my internal secrets and know that nobody else will find out about them. I have other friends too, but she is my best friend. We consider each other's feelings and don't want to hurt each other. We help each other out when we have problems. We make up funny names for people and laugh ourselves silly. We make lists of which boys are the sexiest and which are the ugliest, which are the biggest jerks, and so on. Some of these things we share with friends, but some we don't. Um, so the key thing about this is that um, you can't, the intimacy is that you can talk almost like directly, you know, you don't edit and you don't feel the need to, let's say, use that interpersonal, intrapersonal, let's say, social cognition uh, when interacting with them. You can be unguarded around them. Um, and that's probably also why, you know, when friends sometimes disappoint us, the betrayal is much deeper uh, than, you know, the same activity from someone else because we expect more from the people that are close to us. So what are the functions of this friendship? Uh, the first one is companionship. Uh, you, you know, you want to do something, you want to do something with someone to go see the movies, to play a game. Uh, someone would go to a music concert or some type of other public event. Um, you don't, a lot of people don't want to go alone. Um, you know, very often, like, people will go to, a, like, it used to be a school dance, but they didn't have a partner, um, but they'll go with their friend so they don't feel kind of isolated and alone. Um, if only to be kind of the people on the edges of it, making social commentary about other people's relationships. Um, so even if you're not having fun, at least you can share your, uh, your pain and your angst with someone else who will, sh you know, in a sense, ping pong or mirror that feeling. Um, Another thing is just information, which is like, so what are you doing today? And someone that you can ask and doesn't feel like that's an intrusive question um, can be something that, you know, so what are we going to do? Uh, you know, this makes an idea, makes a decision. Um, and in some ways, instead of just drifting, it kind of gives your, you know, some type of direction to your life. Uh, physical support, like sometimes you need to borrow a pencil or you know, an eraser or a school supply. Sometimes you need help with a test and some, you want someone who's going to be able to assist you. Uh, ego support, which is more about the psychological support, is that people who are going to support you, someone will come and uh, watch your game or your uh, wigs and whisker performance or uh, something like that and tell you you're doing a good job even when maybe you're not doing your best job. So someone is going to be kind of your cheerleader and in your corner, um, uh, sink or swim. Uh, social comparison. So sometimes you need kind of the outside eyes, the outside ears. So like, you know, do you think what I'm wearing is too revealing, not revealing enough, cool in fashion, etc. Uh, you might need to someone to kind of give a barometer, like, am I goofing off too much? Am I need to get serious? Uh, having a friend gives you kind of a uh, kind of a, a way to measure yourself uh, from an objective standpoint rather than from the subjective standpoint that you have of everyone has of themselves. And lastly, just what intimacy and affection, which, uh, and we often talk about intimacy as, as part of a romantic relationship, but it can be part of a friendship too, which means, you know, uh, and I'll just say like, um, one of my good friends from high school, I really don't see him very often. Uh, he lives on the other side of the world in Singapore. Uh, but one of the nice things about him is that I can go two years without talking to him and pick up a conversation as if we just talked the, the, the other day. Um, and I think that's the intimacy and affection that we all want, you know, somewhere in our life, that someone, uh, uh, even when they're not there, they're kind of keeping their, their memories or their thoughts are with us. And I think that's a very important part of friendship. Um, it's not just, you know, uh, someone to do something with, 
or someone to have a, a shared interest or uh, sometimes a friendship can be a pen pal or it can be someone that you knew that moved away uh, one of my wife's very good friends is someone she knew in elementary school um, in west texas uh, my wife moved to dallas uh, her best friend moved to iowa um, they didn't really see each other but you know stayed in close contact and are still best friends as an adults so the point is that intimacy and affection is not something that necessarily has to be for someone who's present physically present in your local you know geography so two things that seem to be characteristic of friendship the one as i've been talking about is intimacy that there's that kind of a privacy or a personal knowledge about a friend um, and you can share kind of personal thoughts and i think um, it makes you feel not alone in the world when sometimes the world can be very lonely. Um, speaking in this age of the coronavirus and the, the quarantine, you know, probably the worst thing is to be by yourself and not be able to communicate or not be able to use social media or call someone up. Um, I think the people who have some type of intimate relationship or, you know, they can talk about their fears, they can talk about their stresses, um, is, a, is an important thing. Um, and I, and you know, I, I think that uh, I can think experience this mostly when I lived in Japan for three years and basically was there doing research and I just basically ate, slept, did work. And I never really stopped because I didn't I was there to, for a job and I really didn't get to know a lot of people. And I was cut off in an age before cell phones uh, and, you know, good Internet from, you know, from talking to people on a regular basis. Um, and the last thing is the similarity, which means we tend to pick our friends that are similar to us, which means age uh, uh friends tend to be of the same gender although this is not true of everyone i think there's always some people who have more friends in the opposite gender uh that they're not uh sexually or romantically interested in um and you see this just if you look at any uh, high school lunch rooms that you'll see some segregation of people into different groups and i can see people who are all from one sports team sitting at one table I can see people who are interested in video games at another table. I can see people who are, um, you know, AP and honor students sitting at another table. Um, and, you know, when I have lunch duty, I kind of see that social dynamic and self-segregation on um, people in different groups based upon shared interests or shared, uh, uh, shared characteristics. So when we talk about groups, and we're gonna talk more about cliques and crowds uh, and going forward in this lecture, um, we need to think about what a group is because there's lots of different types of groups like we have a sports team we have a class we have maybe um a group in gym we have maybe a study group we have people who go on the same bus together um but when we're talking about a group we're talking about a collection of people that has two things the first one is a, a set of norms and they don't have to be formal norms like rules but they can be just like informal norms that are expected that things that apply to all members in the group. So one example of this would be if you want to be part of the honor society, you need to have a certain GPA. Um, if you're a part of a sports team, you have to show up for practice. If you're a part of a, a, a club, you have to support the members in your group. Um, and last and secondly, there's roles, which means there are rules that apply to everyone to be in the group, but then there are different, let's say, functions or roles inside the group. There are leaders, there are supporters, there are people who are kind of mentors, there are people who are, uh, are newbies. Um, and there's some type of, let's say, framework that kind of establishes what every member of the group uh, does something uh, for the group as a whole. And you can think of this in terms of like uh, biology with the cell, which is that there's, they're all in the same cell, but there might be different types of um, organelles and different things with doing different functions for the cell. All working together for the the welfare of the the larger group so first one uh clicks and crowds so clicks are usually groups that are between smalls would be two to about 12 individuals uh there are social reasons why 12 is kind of the cap here it's like the total number of people that can have one conversation together at one time uh generally it's six people six to eight people can easily have one conversation and I think you might see this with social media. Once you start going over eight, 10 people, the ability to have a conversation um, or have a shared identity or in a sense, have a self monitoring as a group uh, starts to fall apart. Um, they, some anthropologists attribute this to hunter gatherer bands that this, that's kind of the maximum side that a self-sufficient band could be is about 15, 20 people. Um, and, and it might be because of the, the, the ability of social monitoring or the people that have a firsthand knowledge of each other uh, more than a superficial knowledge. 
Um, for reasons we talked about before, this is generally uh, segregated by gender, but also segregated by age. A lot of this has to do with like how education is carried out, carried out, that there was kind of a gender division in education, at least historically, and we had kind of an age uh, segregation, um, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Um, and usually there's some similar activity that kind of pulls the clique together. So um, what a clique is, is that it's one where I think people know each other more than just like, hey, you, uh, like very often I find this in, in like a class of 30, that when I put people into groups outside of people, like when I, in the class, there's usually groups of five or six students who all know each other. Um, like everyone in the five or six knows each other and they, they know each other and uh, they know how to collaborate and they know what their roles are and they know what their talents are. But I find when I sometimes randomly assign students to groups um, and they go outside of, let's say, their in-group or outside their clique, they don't know each other. They don't even know other sometimes the names of other people in the class. Um, they just know them kind of just on site. I know who that person is. I know them in the class. And that's more what we're going to talk about is a crowd. Um, as opposed to something that has an in-group identity or has some personal direct knowledge um, and is kind of in a sense social monitoring the other members of the group and can tell you more than just hey that person's name is john or mary or something of that sort so a crowd um, is a larger group and usually it's not a group that knows each other like the members of the group don't know each other um, they're placed into a group because of how they're viewed by other people which means they are a group based upon a reputation um, and the members of the group might not actually know each other or even uh, understand themselves as a group. So, for example, if I say jocks, you know, uh, everyone, a jock is someone who's focused on sports, athletic, um, maybe high self-esteem, very active. Um, they might not all know each other because they're in different sports or they're in different uh, grades or they might not really care for each other as people. In fact, some of them might they might play on the same team, but when the game is over, uh, they go their separate ways. Uh, there was a famous saying about the 1970s Yankees teams that uh, they went home in 27 different taxis. Uh, they were a really good team, but no one liked each other. Um, and that might be kind of the example that they were called the, you know, the Bronx Zoo or the Bronx Bombers collectively, and everyone uh, knew them as members of one uh, crowd, uh, but they didn't really have a lot of overlapping outside of, let's say, uh, outside of that. Uh, kids who are popular very often most no one feels like they're the popular kid everyone feels it's someone else and so this kind of once again kind of the idea that the group is created not by their interaction with each other but by other people's perceptions of them and putting them into a group um, average kids don't see themselves as average they always see themselves as different so the middle of the road students like as a teacher it's pretty easy to see like i can categorize students as you know high performers middle performers or struggling students uh, but very often the students don't have that perception of themselves and they don't have that association. Uh, you might have some that are, you know, maybe we call them delinquents or druggies or toughs, um, which means they seem to be, um, uh, you know, antisocial. They seem to be, in a sense, engaging in delinquent behavior. And by delinquent, I mean uh, behavior that is borderline illegal. Um, um, and they're doing it in a visible way. Um, but I would say in some ways that this is a perception, maybe based on what they, how they dress or what music they listen to, but it might not actually, in a sense, there's some maybe a narrative or a story or a, fic a fictional kind of description of them that doesn't actually describe their real life. And lastly, people who are seen as being low in social skills or abilities and low in self-esteem, uh, people who are wallflowers that really don't talk up for themselves. And they're mostly known by their kind of absence that, you know, uh, very often this comes up when sometimes you unfortunately students who are depressed and uh, suicide is that you know people say like i don't even remember what their voice was like because i never heard them um and they, they're kind of innocence fading and so the point is that we know who these people are from the outside but they don't necessarily know see themselves as a group from the inside there might not be a social cohesion that would be for a click so we're going to turn to our last um you know topic which is about dating and romantic uh and i think the key thing is that dating is a relatively new thing um and most of you have done the play romeo and juliet shakespeare in your freshman year um and this kind of indicates kind of the changes that uh well into the first well, the last maybe 100 120 years uh dating was not about a choice of individuals deciding to date each other 
Um, so you would, you know, there would be like courtships. And so the idea that if you were interested in dating a girl, you had to go ask the father for permission. Or what often would happen is a, a female would stay on their porch and uh, just wait there for people to show up and they would have gentlemen callers who would express interest. And the point is that there wasn't, it wasn't an exclusive thing or one-on-one, -on -one, it's that you kind of uh, had a salon or kind of like a, a party and you kind of stayed at home and the people that were interested in you showed up at your house. If you see kind of let's uh, some of the movie versions of like uh, Jane Austen novels like Pride and Prejudice, you get this idea of a gentleman caller, also kind of um, maybe a southern, you know, uh, debutante kind of model as well that um, you, you you have dates, but they're not dates where you go out to a third place for to socialize. It happens in your parents' house. It happens in full view. Um, it's not necessarily private. Other than that, you might go for a walk, but where you're still seen, like maybe from the front porch to a gazebo, um, but there's really no privacy involved in it. Um, and so the purpose of dating in the past was date was kind of a road to marriage. And as a result, because marriages were also economic alliances, um, your parents had a lot of say over like who is who you could and could not date. Um, I think most modern uh, adolescents would find this really stop, uh, you know, too much helicopter par parenting here. Um, but that is the way that it was. So the most modern is that dating can serve a lot of different functions. So once again, you know, this idea that people are official or they are, you know, a couple, um, you know, that that is recognized as a couple by other people. Um, you often like talk about people who are seriously dating and sometimes even themselves not understanding, like, are we steady? Or are we just seeing other people? Or, um, you know, there are no, there's no handbook or rules of the dating relationship. But, uh, and the point is that people are doing it maybe for different reasons. And these are kind of the eight functions I'm gonna list here. Sometimes it's just to have fun. It's not necessarily to be serious. It's not even about sexual, it's not romantic. It's just like, I like to do something, have a, a, a fun time. So, you know, riding a motorcycle with someone or going to an amusement park. Um, it doesn't have to be, let's say, a serious uh, relationship, but the point is that people like to have fun. People like to have fun in groups. Some things can't be done individually. Um, some people like to date as a matter of like <laughs> keeping score, which means they want to date someone not because they like that person, not because that person likes them, not because this person fits them personality, it's because, well, I want to date someone that everyone else thinks um, is, you know, high class, popular. You talk about people dating above and below their station. Um, it's sort of like this, is that if you can date someone who's considered more attractive or more desirable than you, that raises your, let's say, your status in other people's eyes. Um, it can be socialization, which means part of dating is learning who you are and part of dating is learning how to get along with other people. It's, it's, it's a, like learning on the job. Um, and so there's a socialization process, like sometimes by the rejection that we get in the dating process or the affirmation we get in the dating, pro dating process, we learn like what social behaviors are acceptable or desirable. Um, intimacy, um, I've talked about this before, but I'll leave that aside. Uh, sometimes dating is just for experimentation and exploration. Like, what do I like? So um, I don't really like this person, but I'll kiss them to see what a kiss is like. Um, and I'm not going to go too much in the detail here, but the point is, is that um, you don't necessarily, uh, very often, sometimes people get involved sexually with people who they're not really serious about. And sometimes they're not, um, uh, it's nothing more than what it is. And so this this is a function of dating. So the point is that the idea that this has to lead to marriage and you know, the idea that you, it, I mean, maybe that is an ideal, maybe that's the way it should be. But the point is that's not necessarily how always people are using the are using dating. Uh, companionship. Um, last two, and the last the, the last one, mate sorting selection is kind of the old idea that you need to find out so you can create a family of your own so that you can find someone that can raise for and you're kind of in the sense, giving them a job interview on whether they are gonna be good for that role in your adult life. But I think kind of the be the more important one, and this is something that I appreciate more, is that um, you discover who you are by your interaction with other people, um, which means is that um, very often when you date someone, it's a consuming relationship um, and you lose, you can lose yourself in relationships with other people where you become 
so-and-so's boyfriend or so-and-so's girlfriend. Um, and so you learn to assert your own identity separate from the person that you're involved with, separate from your family. Um, but also that you learn what you like and dislike from your, you know, your romantic partner. You know, I, I like a person who's confident or I like a person who's funny. I like a person who uh, uh, notices small things or has a good sense of humor. So uh, whether you find out what you like by doing it and sometimes often by having bad relationships along the way. So some data on dating. Uh, so it found that adolescents, and it's not surprising, that do not are not involved in romantic relationships, have a lot of social anxiety. Um, I think that the point is that when you don't have someone to call your own, you wonder if you ever will have someone to call your own. And you're just anxiety waiting for when that's going to happen because, A, you don't want to miss it if that big, you know, you know, I have to go to this because I have to go meet someone. I can't just do what I want to do. Um, and when people are in relationships, they take maybe a lot more for granted and their social role, their uh, social place is better established. Um, by 10th grade, 50% have had at least a two month relationship, which on adolescent terms is a long relationship. Um, it seems like a very short relationship to me that two months is, uh, um, you know, not very much of anything. Um, but by senior year, still, there's about a quarter of people have not engaged in a sustained romantic relationship, which means if you don't, haven't dated someone by the time you graduated, you know, you're not necessarily a rare person. Um, and I think a lot of this is that if you don't fit into your where you grew up, where you know you went to high, you know, kindergarten, um, elementary school, middle school, and high school together with the same group of people, um, maybe that person who's a good match for you is not going to be found in that. And I think when you go into a larger world, you meet a lot of different people, and you're more likely to find someone that's compatible with you. And some people um, don't. Um, Girls involved in who are dating tend to have lower grades than ones that are not dating. Um, I won't. Uh, I think the the idea here is not that um, smart girls um, are not attractive and therefore not in relationships. I think it's more about that um, romantic involvements become a distraction or become something that's consuming and takes away from doing your best in academics. And we often find this among uh, girls is that up to about fifth, sixth grade, they are clearly better students um, than boys and their peer um, in the same age group. Um, and what you see is that the grades start to decline relatively to boys during the, uh, the adolescent years. And often this is attributed to um, becoming more socially aware or finding more social pressure or other things that compete with doing well in school while boys do not feel the same types of pressures. Um, so one other thing is about thinking about your partner versus time spent with them. So in seventh and eighth grade, you generally spend about five or six hours thinking about this person for every hour you actually spend with them face to face. Um, part of this is that in seventh and eighth grade, you don't have the ability to go out as much. You don't, can't drive your own car. You can't control your own schedule. You're more dependent upon your parents. Um, so you spend a lot more time thinking about it, um, maybe keeping a book or a journal or um, I don't know, a shrine or whatever what people do but only spend relatively little time by the time you get to a middle late adolescence um kind of the ratios flips which means that you are spending a lot of time with them but not really thinking about them that much when you're not with them um so a little bit about same-sex relationships um there's a little bit of a difference in when uh the sexual activity will start uh girls start a little bit later than boys so boys like who General will um, it will start maybe at a year on average earlier than women uh, girls will. Um, it's generally that it starts off as experimentation with someone who's a close friend. Um, some of this because I think historically, and this might be changing, and you guys would know, you would know better than I would, is that um, the uh, you know uh, there's a fear of rejection. And so with your friend, you can treat it as exploration or uh, practicing how to kiss or under, you know, uh, horseplay or something of that sort. Um, and therefore, that might be a safer zone to, uh, to express or to experiment with some types of feelings. Um, so uh, Adolescent girls who um, become uh, or adult lesbians are more likely to have sexual encounters with boys first 
um, before they experiment with girls, uh, or before they have act, they have uh, committed a, a lesbian relationships, uh, uh, same sex activities, um, and so what happens is that you know they kind of follow con what you might call a socially conventional route, uh, what, while as uh, gay adolescent boys are more likely to do the opposite sequence, which means they are more likely to have a relationship with a boy, a sexual relationship with a boy before they um, they in a sense have relationships with um, the opposite gender. Um, this is based on research. Once again, I think this might be a function of some of the social mores of a previous uh, generation, um, and these are things that are in flux. Um, but it gives you it, the point is that how what society uh, deems appropriate or gives an avenue for people uh, for adolescents to experiment with um, will kind of uh, influence and shape how individuals make their choices about their relationships, and their, particularly their romantic relationships. And whether that's like, what is the role of dating, as we talked in the previous slide, or whether that's whether opposite or same sex uh, relationships develop or not, has a lot to do with uh, social. Um, and our, so just to kind of summarize is that um, I think everyone who's been in love understands this, at least intuitively, that romantic emotions are overpowering. Um, you, they, they're incredibly uh, ego affirming or <laughs> incredibly ego destroying um, that uh, breakups and relationships, falling in love is like becomes a 24 seven obsession that kind of pushes everything else to the side. I think everyone's had friends where they, their friends disappeared when they got involved in romantic relationships. Um, sometimes it's a cause for concern, sometimes it's just a natural phase. Um, that uh, they did a study of um, 8,000 adolescents and those who were in love or kind of infatuated with someone um, often had a higher risk for depression. And you think it's the opposite because, well, they're in love and they're get, they have what they want. You would think they would be happier than not. But in fact, I think what happens is that um, you have strong emotions and strong emotions lead to strong emotions, positive and negative, um, and perhaps more among uh, uh, girls of the same, female adolescents than male adolescents. So, um, you know, there's maybe this last thing about just kind of these are more about social constructions about what love should be. Um, there's romantic love, which is kind of, you know, sometimes described as lust, it has a strong sexual component. Um, it is kind of an infatuation with the physical look of someone. Um, and very often it's what kind of stimulates you or arouses you, um, this romantic love. And then I think that there's another construction of it, which might be more affectionate love, which is more about whether this person does the small things for you or whether this person kind of extends themselves to be supportive, um, and that being more person and being more caring. So very often, I think sometimes people are in relationships that are abusive, where one person is taking advantage of another, while in other, in other situations, um, you know, you find relationships where maybe they are not as stimulating, maybe they're not as exciting, but they are very good about the small things and very supportive about uh, someone's feelings or supporting them in a positive um, uh, growth kind of way. So generally, generally affection and love is seen as a better path toward more mature adult relationships. Um, but I think most of us have experienced a romantic love relationship as well. Um, and some of us, some of the times that's developed to affection and love and sometimes uh, we are still in uh, good and bad relations of that sort, and sometimes people don't develop out of it. So I'm going to uh, end here, um, and I look forward to our next video lecture, which will be coming out later this week.